Dear Father, I thank you for the day that you've given us. I thank you for your Holy Spirit. I pray, Lord, as we go into your word that you would uh, teach us, you would strengthen us, you would prepare us, Lord, for the challenges ahead, for the struggles ahead, but also for the victory that we know in Christ. So, Lord, comfort us and guide us. We love you and we praise you. Amen. Well, if you start the day without caffeine, if you can always be cheerful, ignoring the aches and pains, if you can resist complaining and boring people with your troubles, if you can understand when your loved ones are too busy to give you any time, if you can take criticism and blame without resentment, if you can resist treating a rich uh, friend or um, a rich friend better than a poor friend, if you can face the world without lies and deceit, if you can overlook it when those who love you take it out on you, even though it was no fault of your own when something goes wrong, if you can conquer tension without medical help, if you can say honestly that deep in your heart you have no prejudice against creed, color, religion, or politics, then, my friend, you're almost as good as a dog. (laughs) Well, a famous conductor was once asked which instrument he considered the most difficult to play. His reply, second fiddle. Robert Morrison of China wrote, The great fault, I think, in our mission is that no one likes to be second. Vance Havner wrote in his devotional book, Day by Day, Blessed are the Saints of the Second Fiddle. British pastor George Duncan says that one of the most important lessons in Christian service is that of learning, uh, is that of learning to play the second fiddle well. Think for a moment how often we come across those whose worth is seldom recognized by men, but I'm sure will never be overlooked by God and will certainly not go unrewarded by God. Many are prepared to recognize the prominent part played by Simon Peter among the disciples, but forget that if it had not been for Andrew, his brother, who brought Peter to Jesus, where would have Peter been? Would there have been a Peter? The church universal gives thanks for Paul, the greatest Christian who probably lived. But forget that if there had not been a Barnabas, there not might have been a Paul. Duncan goes on to ask his readers how many of them recognize the name Albert McMacken. But Albert was the young man who invited and took 16-year-old Billy Graham to the evangelistic services where he accepted Christ as Savior. So before there could have been a Billy, there had to be an Albert. When you look at the life of the Lord Jesus Christ, there has always been something that stands out so plainly and powerfully to me. It is his attitude of his mission and the love that he has. In Mark 10, the Lord Jesus is telling his disciples what it means to be his disciples. It is easy to think like the world. It is easy to think in the manner and customs of human nature. If I have position, if I have status or prestige, You people are to recognize that, accept that, and respect that, and honor me because of it. In every culture throughout human history, there's always it's always been the same. There's the king, the lord, the ruler, the sovereign. Regardless if it's a tribe, regardless if it's a nation or a country, that leader leads and is honored by the community. And typically and usually that leader takes advantage of that position and status. He lords it over the people. Do you think in the 20th century when Russia was communist, when they attempted to create an equal society, that they were equal? No. (laughs) The leaders of the Russian uh, government uh, lorded it over their people. What about Mao Zedong? He lorded it over his people in China. It led to death if you did not support the party. It led to imprisonment and more and increased oppression. We cannot stop ourselves. We seek to lord it over other people. We march toward totalitarianism without impunity. Then Jesus, who knows us so well, cut through our arrogance and human selfishness. And he said to his disciples in Mark 10, you know that those who are regarded as rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them. And their high officials exercise authority over them. Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant, and whoever wants to be first must be a slave of all. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and give his life as a ransom for many. 
Christ was committed to a lifestyle of serving and compassion. He sought out people. He healed people. He forgave their sins and he showed them mercy. Christ defined humility. Christ explained compassion. Christ understood our deepest need. He knows that without God, we will continue to march towards suffering and death. And, and with God, we are truly saved. We are truly saved. If Christ, who is God, was a man who served and his first thought was other people, are we not to have the mind of Christ? I challenge you today, serve. Serve because that is the life of Christ. Serve because that is the heart of Christ and the attitude of Christ. Serve because that is who Christ is. He did not seek position. He did not seek status. He did not seek recognition. He sought to serve. He sought to love. In the Conquer series DVDs, the teacher is named Ted Roberts, and he tells this story about a, a preacher, an old preacher who spoke at a high school graduation ceremony. And this preacher had this old gravelly voice, you know. And this is his opening address. to This commencement address at a high school graduation. This is an opening address. He says, one day you're going to die. It's his opening line. One day you're going to die and they're going to put you in a hole, say a few prayers, talk about you, then go back to the church and eat potato salad. <laughs> but I have a question. When you die... Are you going to have a title or a testimony? In Exodus, Pharaoh had a title, but Moses had a testimony. Jezebel, in all her bedizements, I guess that means jewelry, had a title, but Elijah had a testimony. Herod had a title, but my sweet Jesus, he had a testimony. When you die, are you going to have a title or a testimony? I want a testimony. I want to serve as Christ served. Number one, there in your notes, God gives you the opportunity to bless others. Let's go to 1 Kings chapter 12 as we continue our journey through the kings here. 1 Kings chapter 12, start with verse 1. It says, Rehoboam went to Shechem, for all the Israelites had gone there to make him king. When Jeroboam, son of Nebat, heard this, he was still in Egypt where he had fled from King Solomon. He returned from Egypt. So they sent for Jeroboam, and he and the whole assembly of Israel went to Rehoboam and said to him, Your father put a heavy yoke on us, but now lighten the harsh labor and the heavy yoke he put on us, and we will serve you. Rehoboam answered, Go away for three days, then come back to me. So the people went away. In 1 Kings 12, Solomon has died. He reigned as king over Israel for 40 years. He was the wealthiest king that Israel knew. He made silver as common as as regular rock. Gold was used for everything. He built buildings. He built the temple. He built the palace. He explored. He created. He invented. He discovered new things. He wrote proverbs. He sang songs. His brilliance was given to him by God. God who is our wisdom. But toward the end of his life, as you read in 1 Kings 11, the many wives that he had, the 700 wives, began to turn his heart against God. He began to serve other gods and idols. He knelt down before these idols and gave offerings to them. God was angry. If you look at chapter 1 Kings 11, start with verse 9. It says, 1 Kings 11, verse 9, it says, the Lord became angry with Solomon because his heart had, had turned away from the Lord, the God of Israel, who appeared to him twice. Although he had forbidden Solomon to follow other gods, Solomon did not keep the Lord's command. So the Lord said to Solomon, Since this is your attitude and you have not kept my covenant and my decrees which I commanded you, I will most certainly tear the kingdom away from you and give it to one of your subordinates. Nevertheless, for the sake of of David your father, I will not do it during your lifetime. I will tear it out of your hand of your son. Yet I will not tear the whole kingdom from him, but will give him one tribe for the sake of David, my servant, and for the sake of Jerusalem, which I have chosen. The consequences are fierce when you walk away from God. Why do people who start so well in Christ fall away and end so poorly? It's because they lose their intimacy with God. 
People stop praying. People stop seeking and living and loving God. Solomon served God. He lost his first love. He lost his focus. He became distracted and began, and God just simply became part of his life. Not the Lord of his life. God was no longer the Lord of his life. And when God becomes part of your life, you know what happens? You will forget him. You will not worship him. You will ignore him. And that is what happened to Solomon. He lost his intimacy with God. As a result of this disobedience and neglect, God raised up a man named Jeroboam. Jeroboam was an official of Solomon's. He he was in charge of a whole labor force that helped in some building project. A prophet approached Jeroboam one day and told him that God was going to make Jeroboam king because of the sins of idolatry of Solomon. God would take the ten tribes and give one tribe to David and Solomon. Well, Solomon attempted to kill Jeroboam, but Jeroboam fled to Egypt until Solomon died. This was a prophetic statement by God. This was a prophetic reality. God was going to do this. The kingdom would be split. The split was to humble David's line because of the idolatry committed. What are they going to do? I tell you, sir. Number one observation, understand your calling. You know, as we read about the new king, Rehoboam, it opens up with an interesting statement. Rehoboam went to Shechem. You go, what is up with that? Rehoboam went to Shechem. Why this place? Why Shechem? Jerusalem would have been the place to anoint the new king. Jerusalem is where the palace is. Jerusalem is where Solomon reigned and David before him. Yet they go to Shechem because Rehoboam knows there's a rift brewing between the north and the southern uh, tribes. Rehoboam wanted to maintain a good relationship with the northern tribes. He wanted to sort of kind of keep them together and keep this civil war from taking place. But going to Shechem is all that he's going to do to accommodate the northern tribes. That's enough for him. When all are assembled, Shechem in a grand ceremony in some fashion is made king. And the people applaud and the enactment has secured his place as king. But Jeroboam has returned. And with all the kingdom watching, he asks a question. Will you ease up on the harsh labor? Now, throughout your lifetime, you're presented with questions that are pivotal and could be life changing. Regret comes from these kind of moments from time to time. The what if questions come to mind. The should I have done something different question comes to mind. Either way, you're typically faced with a question, a milestone moment like Rehoboam was here. The reality of the question that you have is not so much the what, but the who when you answer this question. Who are you? What makes us make decisions? What is your calling? What is your vision? Why are you doing what you're doing? You see, when Rehoboam was made king, what was his calling? What was he supposed to do? How was he supposed to live his life? What was his role as king? What is the vision that God gave him? What is the vision that God has given you? When you are faced with a question, you have to ask yourself, not what you will gain, but how can I serve? How is Christ glorified by the decisions I make? How is God exalted? Is this about me or is it about God? It's the question I have to answer. When I make decisions, when you start with Christ in your life, that is your vision and that is your calling. When you start with yourself, you become your vision and your calling. If you are following the will of God, regardless of when the questions of life come, if you are obedient, then you're honoring him. You're exalting God. What is the compelling factor in making decisions? Is it Christ or is it you? I challenge you, sir. Second observation, move in the direction of God. Richard S. Halverson, the former U.S. Senate chaplain, used to challenge people with this following picture or image that he would make. He says, you're going to meet an old man or woman someday down the road, 10, 30, 50 years from now, waiting there for you. You'll be catching up with them or with him or her and what kind of old man are you going to meet he may be seasoned soft gracious fellow a gentleman who has had who's grown old gracefully surrounded by hosts of friends friends who call him blessed because of what his life has meant to them or he may be bitter disillusioned dried up old buzzard without a good word for anyone (laughs) soured friendless and alone 
that old man will be you. He'll be the composite of everything that you do, say, and think, today and tomorrow. His mind will, will he see in a mold you have made by your own beliefs. His heart will be turning out what you've been putting in. Every little thought, every deed goes into this old man. Every day and every way, you're becoming more and more like yourself. Amazing, but true. You're beginning to look more like yourself, think more like yourself, and talk more like yourself. You're becoming yourself more and more. Love only in terms of what you're getting out of life, and the old man gets smaller, drier, harder, crabbier, more self-centered. Open your life to others. Think in terms of what you can give. Your contribution to life, and the old man grows larger, softer, kindlier, and greater. I challenge you, sir. As Rehoboam has asked this question, he tells them to give him some time to think. Give me a few days, and then I'll give you my answer. You know, as I read this chapter, I see something missing. He never talks to God. He never seeks him out. He never calls for a prophet. He never seeks the heart of God. He makes decisions as if God is absent. Where is God in Rehoboam's life? In 1 Kings 14, we see that Rehoboam was 41 years old, a young guy, when he became king. And he served for 17 years, and his legacy is one of idolatry. Idolatry. Let's take a look at 1 Kings 14. Turn there to in verse 22. It says this, Judah did evil in the eyes of the Lord. It's interesting they don't say Rehoboam did evil. It says Judah did evil. By the sins they committed, they stirred up his jealous anger more than their fathers had done. They also set up for themselves high places, sacred stones and asherah poles on every high hill and under every spreading tree. There were were even male shrine prostitutes in the land. The people engaged in all the detestable practices of the nations the Lord had driven out before the Israelites. They're never, you look at the, the idolatry, you look at it leads to immorality and immorality leads to disobedience, more and more disobedience and, and neglect of God and, and loss of intimacy with God. There is no thought of God in the land of Judah as Rehoboam is king. There is never a mention of Rehoboam ever seeking God, ever crying out to him. What was he doing for 40 years before he became king? What did he see in his father Solomon in the latter part of his life as Solomon is walking away from God, moving away from him? So Rehoboam moves away from God. He lost his calling. He lost his vision of what God wanted. He led people away from God, not toward them, not toward him. He lost his calling. You know, this world will never move in the direction of God. We know that. We see that. It will move in the direction of self-centeredness and selfishness. The righteousness of God will continue to be mocked and challenged. Don't be surprised that it happens. But resolve in your heart right now that you will not be moved. You will not be swayed. You will not be pressed to follow the ways of the world. Resolve in your heart today that you will stand as a moral voice, speaking of Christ, renewing your calling, shouting his name, following his path, And serving your Lord. Resolve right now that you will not be conformed by the ways of the world. The ideologies, the philosophies, and the politics of humanism. But be transformed by the power of the Holy Spirit. And the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. Be transformed. And walk in the newness of life. Number two. God gives you the opportunity for you to listen. God gives you the opportunity for you to listen. Let's take a look at verse 6 of chapter 12. Then King Rehoboam consulted the elders who served his father during his lifetime. How, could you advi- how would you advise me to answer these questions, he asked, or answer these people. They replied, if today you will be a servant to these people and serve them and give them a favorable answer, they will always be your servants. But Rehoboam rejected the advice the elders gave him and consulted the young men who had grown up with him and were serving him. He asked them, what is your advice? How should we answer these people who say to me, lighten the yoke your father put on us? The young man who had grown up with him replied, tell these people who have said to you, your father put a heavy yoke on us, but make your, our yoke lighter. Tell them my little finger is thicker than my father's waist. My father laid on you a heavy yoke. I will make it even heavier. My father scourged you with whips. I will scourge you with scorpions. 
Three days later, Jeroboam and all the people returned to Rehoboam as the king had said, Come back to me in three days. The king answered the people harshly, rejecting the advice given to him by the elders. He followed the advice of the young man and said, My father made your yoke easy. I will make it even heavier. My father scourged you with whips. I will scourge you with scorpions. So the king did not listen to the people, for this turn of events was from the Lord, to fulfill the word of the Lord had spoken to Jeroboam, son of Nebat, through Ahijah, the Shilonite, the prophet. You know, Rehoboam thought, although he does not seek out the will of God, he did seek out the advisors and elders that, the, that had served Solomon. And these guys understood the political climate that existed. They gave him the advice that necessarily that Rehoboam didn't want to hear, but he knew what was good for the kingdom. And Rehoboam does not like what these elders had to say. He does not appreciate what they said because they did not tell him what he wanted to hear. Now, you have to understand that the answer that Rehoboam is given is not about keeping the kingdom together. We know it will be split. The kingdom will be split. Jeroboam will make it happen because if Rehoboam gave in to the demands of the people, Jeroboam probably would have found some other means to do it. But what you have to realize is that God's will is played out in the pride of man. God did not have to make Rehoboam prideful. He just had to expose his pride. And he knew the kingdom would be split. It was the same with Pharaoh in Egypt. First observation. Listening is serving. Is serving. Listening is serving. You have a mindset of serving. You have the heart of God. Rehoboam went to Shechem to calm what he saw as a civil unrest about to break open. He thought by just showing up, that was good enough. (laughs) I showed up. You ought to serve me. We're good. I accommodated you. He had served them. He had done his duty. But then the question came, can you ease up? Can you calm down on the harsh labor and the heavy yoke? What really got him mad, though, was that there was a condition attached to it. If you ease up, we'll serve you. And what happens when you expose a prideful heart? You get anger. You get force. You get oppression. You know, Jesus was never about anger. He was never about force or oppression. He was about serving. He, let's take a look at Rehoboam's life. He grew up rather wealthy, didn't he? His father was a, a multi-billionaire. He probably went to the finest schools. If he lived today, he would have probably gone to an Ivy League school, got a car at 16, a $100,000 car. He would have had a billion-dollar trust fund. He would have enjoyed the finest food. He would have traveled around the world. He was basically a spoiled kid, Rehoboam. And he grew up with kids who were given what they wanted. The people that he went to and said, what should I say to them? Those were the kids he grew up with. Those were the kids that also had wealthy homes and wealthy lifestyles. He had it all. But where was God in all of this? What did Solomon teach him? Did Solomon even know Rehoboam with 700 wives? I'm sure he had more than one kid. What did Solomon teach him? What did Rehoboam see? When you receive this much power without really gaining it, you do whatever you can to keep it. Rehoboam wanted to live like his father, but he wanted more than that. He wanted to be better than his father. He wanted to be better than his father in power, not in serving. All he had to do was listen to God, obey him, and he would have been greater than his dad. I guarantee you that had Rehoboam followed God, listening to God, served God, God would have blessed him nonetheless. So now Rehoboam has rejected the elders of of Solomon's advisors. And he goes to the elders of the young men that he grew up with who had the same lifestyle who had the same wealth, prestige, education, literature, status, and egos the size of Texas. <laughs> they knew Rehoboam, and he hired them as part of his cabinet. They are royal officials. They are spoiled and full of pride. And they basically tell Rehoboam that he's to be the one that will make the conditions, not them, not the people. You make the conditions. The people don't make the conditions. If you think Solomon was tough, Rehoboam, you're going to be tougher. Why is it that we think that we have to have to, by way of force, demand people to live a certain way? Why not inspire them? Why not serve them? You know, there's a sad statement in verse 15, 12, 15. So the king did not listen to the people. 
He did not listen, so he did not serve. He had a vision, and that vision was about him, not God. Christ is different. He offered. He did not demand. You, uh, Rehoboam says, you think Solomon's yoke was heavy? Mine's going to be heavier. What does Jesus say in Matthew 11? He says, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I'm gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. What a contrast. I challenge you, serve. Second observation. Listening is respect. Listening is respect. You know, to listen to someone is to respect them. What was Rehoboam going to gain by harsh labor? Buildings were built. Peace was secured. The path wide open. What would he gain? But for some reason... He was feeling disrespected, so he knew force was the way to go, the only way to go in his mind. Why not try humility? Why not seek God? What would have happened? You know, when I I remember in 1996, I graduated from seminary with my master of divinity, masterfully divine. (laughs) (laughs) And, you know, when I graduated with my master's degree, I was the smartest man in the world. Any church issue I could handle. Bring it on. I was the smartest man there was. My ego was huge. I remember I mo- we moved to Massachusetts where I was to serve as an assistant pastor of this church, Brockton, Massachusetts. And of course, save it from all of its mistakes, right? Of course. And I remember ha- thinking how certain people in this church was keeping the church from moving in the right direction. Those people were the elderly people, the senior citizens. They just didn't appreciate how great, how smart I was and how brilliant I was. And I remember thinking, well, they won't stop me. We'll just do it. We'll just make the change. Whatever the issue, we'll make the change. We'll just force it on them. And I remember one day as I'm reading and studying, God spoke to me. Mark, you have a prejudice. You have a prejudice, a deep prejudice. Do you see how you view certain people in the church? And it brought me to my knees, and I remember just weeping before God, saying, I'm so sorry, God. I'm truly sorry. And so the next Sunday, I get up, and I confess my sins to the church. And I said to those people, I said to the people, the senior citizens, and I apologized to them, I am truly sorry for my attitude. And you know the beautiful thing is, he took it away. He took it away. And I, could, and I gained a new appreciation of their wisdom and their beauty and their servanthood. And I didn't feel that way anymore. And they became some of my closest friends. They were a blessing to me. So I tell you, serve. Number three, God lets you face the consequences of your actions. Let's look at verse 16. When all Israel saw that the king refused to listen to them, they answered the king, What share do we have in David? What part in Jesse's son? To your tents, O Israel. Look after your own house, O David. So the Israelites went home. But as the Israelites who were living in the towns of Judah, Rehoboam still ruled over them. King Rehoboam sent out Adoram, who was in charge of forced labor, but all Israel stoned him to death. King Rehoboam, however, managed to get into his chair and escape to Jerusalem. So Israel had been in rebellion against the house of David to this day. When all the Israelites heard that Jeroboam had returned, they sent and called him to the assembly and made him king over all Israel. Only the tribe of Judah remained loyal to the house of David. When Rehoboam arrived in Jerusalem, he mustered the whole house of Judah and the tribe of Benjamin, 180,000 fighting men to make war against the house of Israel and to regain the kingdom of Rehoboam, son of Solomon. But this word of God came to Shemaiah, the man of God. Say to Rehoboam, son of Solomon, king of Judah, to the whole house of Judah and Benjamin and to the rest of the people. This is what the Lord says. Do not go up to fight against your brothers and the Israelites. Go home, every one of you, for this is my doing. So they obeyed the word of the Lord and went home again as the Lord had ordered. As Rehoboam rejected the advice from the elders of Solomon and accepted the advice of those kids who had grown up with him, what you are seeing on both sides is a lack of humility. We refuse to work with you. What you see is pride taking over. You see no willingness to seek after God's heart. What you see is, is an unwillingness to serve and to seek out the will of God. What you see is civil war. The two kingdoms are now, unfortunately, a reality. Division. 
First observation, do the right thing. Even though it was destined to be split because of the idolatry of Solomon, why could Rehoboam not have done the right thing? What would have happened had he done the right thing? Many times when faced with certain situations, when our lives are challenged, when we're made fun of, when we're attacked, when we, we attack back, I say, let's do the right thing. What would happen had Rehoboam acquiesced to the people's demands? I tell you what would have happened. The onus would have been on Jeroboam. He would have had to make the next move. He would have had to force the issue. He would have had to do something. When you do the right thing, you're putting the pressure on others to demand their own way. You're standing against the opposition, the enemy, and the ideologies of the world. Immediately when Rehoboam returns and gives Jeroboam's group his answer, civil war erupts. Civil war erupts. However, it also gave fuel for Jeroboam to accomplish his desire of being king. Had Rehoboam eased up, given them freedom, helped them, inspired his people, sought sought after the Lord, Jeroboam would have had to find another way. When you face opposition, do the right thing. When you're attacked, do the right thing. When you're not appreciated, do the right thing. When you're insulted, do the right thing. When you mess up, do the right thing. And the right thing is to serve. I'm reminded of Jesus' word in, in Matthew 5, verses 38 through 42. You heard that it was said, eye for eye, tooth for tooth. But I tell you, do not resist an evil person. If someone strikes you on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. And if someone wants to, sue, wants to sue you and take your tunic, let him have your cloak as well. If someone forces you to go one mile, go with him two miles. Give to the one who asks you and do not turn away from the one who wants to borrow from you. You know, as I contemplate these words, I realize the amazing love that, could have, that we can have because of Christ. And when we live this out, the amazing love that is seen... To glorify God. When I read these words of Christ, Christ is calling us to do the right thing. When the world, the culture, the ideologies and the philosophies are demanding us to do something different. When they are trying to make us not do the right thing, we do the right thing. When they're demanding we follow after them, we do the right thing. We follow God. You see, if you act in the manner of your own heart, you will follow the ways of this world. But if you follow God in his heart, you will stand opposed to the ways of this world. When your own heart tempts you away, when the shiny new toy calls you, when the politics and the ideas of the culture sway you, do the right thing. Honor God. Serve others. You know, as I look at the people in this town, as I see people falling into sin, walking in immorality, my heart breaks for them. As I read about the politics of the day, as I hear about the shooting in Charleston and the horror of that event, and also the ridiculous politicking that goes on after that, I can easily get angry. As I look at the way certain uh, radical Muslims attack people, kill, hurt, maim, laugh, and look it down on people, I want to get angry. I want to get even. As I look at the exploitation of racism by our own leaders, as I see the exaltation of immorality and the foolishness of how people think, I want to get angry. But then I realize that is exactly what the enemy wants me to do. These people do not know any better. They're following their own heart's desire. They're drinking from the fountain of human wisdom and human knowledge. They're walking to their death. They're lost in their transgressions. They do not have the mind of Christ. What should I expect? If that is the case, then I better serve. I better show them Christ. I better shine Christ. I better live Christ. I better be the voice of Christ. I better have the hands and feet of Christ. I better serve because I may be, you may be, the only light of Christ that they see today. They, you may be, I may be the only light of Christ to the people around me. And let me, tell, let me ask you, will they appreciate what you do? They may laugh at you. They may mock you. They may hate you. They may insult you. They may reject you. They may accept you. But regardless of their attitude, let's not give up. 
Let's not get distracted. Let's not lose focus. Let's not get angry or be filled with hate, but to love Christ, to love others and serve. I can get angry. I can get mad or I can say they don't know Christ, so I better show them Christ. Will you join me? Let us serve. What would have happened had Rehoboam done the right thing? Now, that would have been an interesting turn of events, wouldn't it? The sad reality is that's what we see. What Rehoboam did is what we see all the time happening every day. I challenge you to serve. Let's pray. Father God, as I come before you today, thank you for compassion that you taught us and and how to serve. And Lord, uh, I pray that you give me Christ's heart. Because if I leave it up to me, I'll do the wrong thing. So, Lord, I pray that in Christ I do the right thing. And I exalt you all the time. Come, Lord Jesus. We desperately need you today. As we look into the future, we don't know what what will happen. But we praise you that you are king and sovereign no matter what. So, Lord, call us to yourself each day. And may we be faithful. Let nothing of this world sway us. Let nothing in this thing, let nothing of the enemy uh, tempt us away from you. But may we stay truly rooted and resolve in our heart that we love you. In Jesus' name.